things you ought to know. Oh, I'm sometimes I worry you're going to be so tired of this before we get 13 weeks of this in. But I'll do this. I'll keep the main title, and this coming Sunday we'll change the subject. Uh, but we're still to the point today. We're talking about the Word of God. Five things you ought to know about the Word of God. Uh, and the key issue tonight is about the power of the Word of God or the empowerment of God's Word. Uh, a lot of times we just read it and we don't think much about it. and oh, we, we, we think, well, it's not doing anything. Oh, it's doing, folks. I promise you a lot of our problems with believing the Word of God and living by the Word of God and accepting the Word of God is we don't understand how it really works. We don't understand what God is in the midst of doing and what His Word is doing, and we're making major mistakes in our life. Power comes in three precepts, or three different forms, three different ways, however you want to look at it. It comes in strength, such as muscular strength. It comes in effect. And the third way is it comes in time. So as we think about the power and the power of God's word, you've got to understand it through those three areas. When you think about it in the presence of strength, the ability to make a physical change in the location or shape, this means to overpower. Well, the word is actually power in the New Testament. comes from the word dudimos, which is the same word we use uh, for dynamite. Uh, if I was to try to give you some examples of this, if there's two men and they're both strong, the stronger man ultimately wins the wrestling match or wins the fight. Uh, if it's between moving an object and where I push and, and try to lift and I cannot, but somebody more powerful than me comes along and they pick it up and they take it outside and they say, well, it wasn't that heavy. Uh, that is the difference in one level of power and another level of power. And a lot of we don't just realize how powerful the Word of God actually is. In Matthew 28, verse 18. Now, you recognize this verse, but we sometimes read verse 19 and 20 and leave verse 18 even out. And it said, Jesus spake unto them, saying, all power. It, it's not an indication to say um, that uh, every piece of electricity and every atomic weapon, that, that's a good process to think about that, there's, there's all the power of this world is under the control of God, uh, but it's, it really means more than that when it says that it is all powerful or all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He's literally saying there's nothing more powerful than me. There's nothing more powerful than the word of God. And when we doubt the word of God or we look at somebody and we think, well, that person just really... Uh, is, is not doing well in their life and what can we do for them? Uh, there's a lot of hopeless people in the world today that are dealing with illnesses or drugs or alcohol and things that they do not think they can overcome. But I'm telling you tonight that the Word of God is able to make anybody who accepts it, lives it, obeys it, follows it to overcome the power of anything. Usually, it's not about the power that is given to us. It's the power of God upon a person that is rejected. When God says, don't give up, the flesh gives up. We give in. We decide, I'm not strong enough. Or God can't even get me through this. God can do anything, folks. He is powerful enough and his word is powerful enough. In Matthew 21, 21, if ye shall say unto uh, this mountain... Be ye removed, and be thou cast into the sea. It shall be done. And a lot of people read that verse and says, Yeah, I've, I've stood in front of a mountain and prayed all day. Well, I, I believe that if there was a need and the purpose of God's will for the biggest mountain in the Smoky Mountains to be picked up and cast into the sea, my God can do it. And his word says it is that powerful. He can do it. But there better be a reason to move the mountain. Don't test God. Don't mock God by saying, well, God, prove yourself to me and move that mountain. Well, you don't have molehill faith yet. You've got, your faith has to grow. Your belief in what God's word has to grow over time. Uh, 
and I really don't think this verse was so much about a bunch of rocks piled up somewhere and being moved. I think there's a lot more bigger mountains than any tall mountain, any wide or broad mountain in our life. Sometimes the biggest mountain is right in your heart, in your mind, or right in front of you. And for God to do that is bigger and greater to trust his word, to read his word and find the comfort of his word than to, for God to actually move a mountain. Uh, I, you know, I'm thrilled. Susan needed what happened Sunday night with that ring uh, for her faith. It, uh, she's been going through several things and just, just going on and on and on. And that just, that just gave her some reassurance and faith. But you know, folks, finding that ring was not a life-changing experience. If that ring had been lost and never found, and yes, it's a very expensive ring, it would not have made a hill of beans in this world. It was only the miracle was for what it did for her faith, that God heard a prayer and answered it. Those are the bigger mountains that me and you have in our lives, that God begins to move the mountains of faith to make us stronger. And it's not going to happen if you're not in the Word of God. The Word of God gives us the power to live and to follow. Not only does it mean strength and power and the ability to pick up something, move, or uh, to blow it up like dynamite could just destroy an entire mountain with enough nitroglycerin or, or dynamite, but it also has a second meaning. The power of the Word of God is to deal with the effect that is the ability to influence behavior and course of events. There's a lot of decisions that people make, and they make them contrary to the Word of God. And if you make a decision contrary to the Word of God, there is great effect upon your life. There are wrong decisions made that get you further from God. And I don't know how aware we are of this, but if God calls you to go this way, and you go this way a, a half a mile, and you finally get a half a mile away, and you say, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing. I need to turn around and go back to God. You start out a, mile, a half a mile in the hole. Wouldn't it have been better if I had been right here and I'd said, oh, I know what the Word of God teaches. I know what it says. I know what I should do. I know how to obey the Word of God. I'll just do what the Bible says. Forget what I think. <laughs> Forget what I think. Uh, if I had a dime for every time someone explained to me why it was God's will for their life. And I'm sitting there going, it's contrary to the Word. Is contrary to the word. You can't do that. There's a price. There's a cost. When you violate the word of God, there's an effect. But also, the good part, when you obey the word of God, there's an effect. Amen. You change the course of your life and the life of many, many people around you. You either are pulling people away from God or pulling people to God. Years and years ago, a woman started coming to our church. And she said every Sunday morning she got up and she would go in there and she'd say to her husband, I'm going to church today. Are you not going to get up and go with me? And she, she said he didn't get up and go. He wouldn't get up and go. He didn't want to get up and go. And for years, she said that was a Sunday morning event telling her husband, please get up and go to church with me. And she said, she started, she went in one Sunday morning, she said, I'll never ask you to go to church again, but I'm going to pray every day that God will convict you and you'll go to church with me. And he began to hear his wife praying at night and praying on Sunday mornings, Lord, I almost called his name, y'all all know him, Lord, my husband is not serving you. Lord, I need a spiritual leader. Lord, do something in his life. And he became a deacon at Finley Baptist Church after giving his heart to Jesus, turning his life around, and becoming a part of the Word of God. They've moved off. Some of y'all are, are trying to figure it out already. But you know, her behavior, oh, what's the old phrase? The nag at the glue factory is just going to the glue factory. Uh, but the power of the Word of God in prayer can change things. It has an effect 
And the Word of God says to the women, win your husband by your conversation. And that is not the, go to church with me, go to church with me, go to church with me. It's by letting him see that you're going to love God and serve God no matter what, and that you welcome him to serve God with you. Now that's one of 50,000 illustrations. Our children, we need to pray and minister and let the Word of God affect them. But the Word of God has the power to affect our life and to change our lives, our homes, our communities, the places we work, and our nation. Doesn't the Bible tell us that when we as Christians are obeying and serving God, when Christians get right, that he will redeem the nation? He will bless the nation when he's able to bless his people? That's the influence of God's Word. Psalms 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That's the influence. You put God's word in here. When you're battling with sin, quote the scriptures. When Jesus was confronted by the devil, tempting him to sin, he didn't say, go away, devil. I am the son of God. You have no power over me. No, he quoted scripture. You know how you can overcome sin? Quote the scripture. When you know you're battling with sin, go to the Word of God, find that sin, confess that sin, and then take control with the Word of God to overcome it. Because when you put the Word of God in your heart, He says, I can change your life. In Ephesians 5.26, He's speaking to Christians here that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word. The act of sanctification is what happens in a Christian life. It makes you a better Christian, a stronger Christian. But it is only by what? By the Word of God. God, you take a bath in God's Word every day and He keeps you clean. You take a shower in the Word of God and it washes away this worldliness. Even the very principle, uh, we don't practice foot washing. Maybe we ought to practice it some Sunday for those who want to come for it. Uh, but the foot washing itself is a whole picture of sanctification because Jesus Christ died and cleansed us completely and the day we got saved we were made every whit whole the Bible says and that foot washing means that I go out in the world and I walk in the world and I come back it's time to wash my feet the disciples went to Passover after taking a bath and putting on a brand new garments where the Easter robes come from putting on a brand new garment and got to Passover and when they got there they walked down the dusty streets of Jerusalem and he says your feet are dirty we need to wash feet and Jesus took his garment off girded himself with a towel and washed the feet of the disciples Peter said what Lord wash me every whit whole and basically what Jesus said back to him was this, didn't you take a bath before you came haven't you been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ? But every day you need your feet washed. If you don't wash your feet, the mud begins to stack up. Some of us might be knee deep or waist deep or neck deep in the things of this world. Jesus says it's the word of God, the washing by the word of God. Romans 12 verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? Be changed by the renewing of your mind. And the only thing the Bible says that renews your mind is the word itself. It is the cleansing factor. It makes you change your mind from what is wrong to what is right. Don't be conformed to thinking like the world. Think like Jesus Christ. The third area of power is the power to outlast. If I was to try to put that in a very quick terminology, I, I would probably say something to the effect that it doesn't matter what it is, God will outlast it. When somebody, our nation's in a terrible shape, folks. Our nation is, is more God denying than ever before. But they're not going to do away with God. One of these days, he will rise up and say, enough. And he will either bring America to his knees or he will destroy America or Jesus Christ will come back and when we get to heaven, there won't be anybody there saying they don't believe in God. I, I'm just going to get something off my chest, okay, because it's driving me crazy. I don't know what news channels you watch, but they were impeaching the president the other day and they had that on TV going and they were opening up the scene and on Fox News they showed and I about fell out on the floor. A preacher came forth and prayed. Any of y'all see that? When the very thing first started, they let this preacher pray. I said, Amen. 
Man, we need to, we need prayer back in in our government. And I had this idea. I wonder if they're showing that on CNN. And so I go over to CNN, and they're showing yesterday's, and they're saying the proceedings will start in a minute. No, the proceedings had already started, but they didn't want prayer. And then I turned back over to Fox to catch the end of the guy's prayer. He prayed a pretty good prayer, too. And then I got blown away some more. Chief Justice Roberts stood up and said, would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Uh, and if I'd found out somebody had kneeled, I probably would have shot them through the TV. But to my knowledge, nobody did. And they stood together and they pledged the flag of America. But I want you to know, redeemed or not as a nation, forgiven or not as a nation, return as a nation or not, when America runs its course, God will still be in control. The word of God will always be true. The word of God, whatever it has been, when Caesar said that he would destroy it, he couldn't. He had to bring Christianity into the Roman government to make his own government hold up. But if we don't understand the principle that God's word and what God has said is going to be around when everything... Well, let's just get to the Bible. Let's just let the Bible say it for us today. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? Together, my word shall not pass away. On the final day of judgment, when someone stands before God, and they say, well, I just didn't believe the Bible. Somebody's going to have to say, well, you should have. Well, you can't judge me by the Bible. Yes, I can. Well, I don't believe it. I don't care if you believe it or not. The Bible will ask, outlast anybody, everybody, or anything. Amen. Let's do it again. Isaiah, I wanted to do the other verse again, but we'll do this one. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6. All flesh is grass. Now, it doesn't mean this flesh is made out of grass. It's meaning it's like grass. And all the goodness thereof is as the flowers of the field. Now, the goodness is the good acts of man, the, the good things that man might do. And the grass withers, and the flower fadeth. In other words, the flesh is going to die, and everything that I've ever done good or nice for anybody is going to go away. But the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Uh, have you ever taken that little, when the dandelion turns into a, a bubble and hope and go, and what happens to everything on it? Because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass, and the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth. And I'll tell you what it says in Matthew, and they throw it into the fire, and they burned it. All the dried grass, all the dead tree limbs, they throw it in the fire and burns it. It's all going to fade away. But, but the word of our God, the Bible, shall stand for a few years. For a little while, for a millennial. No, forever. And I like the, I learned this a long, long time ago. And I, I wish I had the uh, Bible in the correct form so you could see the punctuation. Have you ever read something at the end of the sentence? Uh, it, it said, and blue and red and green, and then it said, etc. What does etc. mean? Yeah, c continue on with it. In the language of the Bible both in the Hebrew and another symbol in the Greek. When you see forever, almost 90% of the time, not every time, but almost 90% of the time, they have that symbol. It's kind of like a, a it looks more like a, a dollar symbol with slash marks through it. There's one in music means to, to go on with it. And it means like to read it this way. And the word of God shall stand forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and ever, it means you don't quit. Same thing is used in the book of Revelation where it says that they will glorify God forever and ever and ever. So when will the word of God come to an end? Yeah. Never, never, never. There's the authority of the word of God. We need to understand that when God's word speaks, it doesn't speak in a suggestion or a casual conversation. It speaks as this is what God has said and you have no choice. You have a choice to accept or to receive it, but it's true. You have, a, you have a choice to do what's right or to do what's wrong. You do, but the Bible's right. 
There's not going to come a time when God's plans change. The word of God, the authority of God, and every one of God's promises. God's never made a promise that he did not keep. In Romans chapter 4, verse 21, being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to perform. If God said he's going to do it, he's got it covered. God is not in heaven wringing his hands trying to get us to the end of the time and Jesus coming back. He knows exactly what he's doing and exactly where we are and exactly what's going to happen. And he tells us in the word of God. You know, if God had never told us, then we could say, I wonder how he's going to do it. He tells us in the word of God how he's going to do it. We might not understand it, but it's here. And he says, it's going to happen. You just got to wait and it's going to happen like I say. I like Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. There are two immutable, which means unchangeable things in which was impossible that God should lie. Not that God would get up and say, you know, something got broke and you say, I didn't do it and you did. That's a lie. That's not what that means. That God cannot lie that God's going to come to you and say, well, I, I'm really not going to save you. Uh, that's not what this means here. It means that in all the promises and everything that God has said or done, it's impossible for God not to complete it. If you're in next week's book, you read Sovereignty today. Uh, don't be afraid of that word. In the right biblical sense, it's a great thing to know that I can't mess God's plan up. And that God wants me in the midst of his plan. God's word, God's authority. And just quickly, the whole concept. When you're reading the word of God, realize that there is the word of God. Now there are translations. And there are versions. And there are paraphrases. And there are denominational Bibles. The last thing you ever need to buy is a denominational Bible. Uh, if you own a Williams Bible, that is called a Baptist Bible. And you need to throw it out the window. Not because what's in it's not true. But because when that Bible was penned, it was penned for the purpose to give the slant by what Baptists believe. I don't need a slant by what Baptists believe. Just give me the word of God. I don't need a paraphrase. And I use paraphrases. I like paraphrases. Uh, they make it easier to read and study and understand and get some great illustrations. Paraphrases is, takes a part of the verse. Another one is called an amplified Bible. It tells you a little bit of phrase that comes out of the Bible. And then they, they take a person who likes to talk a lot. And he goes to telling you what all that means. He's paraphrasing. Oh, it's kind of like what a preacher does every Sunday morning when he gets up to preach. He reads your person a piece of Bible and then he starts paraphrasing it so you understand what the Bible verse you just read is. But you don't want to read a paraphrase and say that's the word of God. Because a paraphrase is not a translation or a version, either one. And a translation uh, is really to take one from a language to another language. To take it from English to Chinese or, or Hebrew to uh, Russian or whatever language. That, that's what a real translation is. A lot of times we talk about uh, the King James translation. It is only that because it was translated from maybe the Greek and the Hebrew into an English language. It's technically a version. You might have seen someone say the AV, the authorized version of the Bible. There are more than one authorized versions of the Bible, but not many. Uh, most of them are older than the, than the King James Bible. Uh, the New King James is a good version, and it's a good translation. Uh, they did the very same thing that the old King James did. The old King James took the Hebrew and the Greek and put it into the English language of the day and time. You know, after 1611 and 1616, they made a, the New King James was actually written in 1616. The 1611 was still considered too hard to read, so in 1616, they made it a little bit easier to read. The Bible you hold in your hand that is the King James that people call the 1611 version is more likely the 2021, 1620, 1621 version. That this is the third to make it easier to read. And the new King James that came out in the late 60s, early 70s, is still the King James Bible. They just changed the these and the thous to uh, everyday common English, just like they did when they translated the 1611 to the 1616. And remember, I, I meant to have it on screen so you could see what the, a true 1611, we would have difficult reading it. I still think the King James, to me, is the best translation. But... Holman Christian Standard is a translation and a version. It's still good. 
I do not like the new NIV. If you have an old NIV, you might be good, but be careful buying the new NIV. I'm running out of time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is a private interpretation. That means you can't come up with it. And that's what people do. When you have a denominational Bible, some man sat down and decided what they thought it believed. Even when some people have made other versions of the Bibles or other translations, um, such language. There, there's a place in the Bible where the word poison is used, uh, and yet when it's translated to Chinese, it does not mean a, a poison like you drink and it, it will kill you. Uh, it's, it's more like a, a heartache uh, than it is a poison. Well, you say, well, heartache and drinking poison is two different things completely. Uh, but see, someone just translated it, and they didn't translate it to a word in the Chinese language that meant that. Uh, so a lot of times, it needs. I don't need to be a Bible translator. Amen? Amen. Uh, you need to have people who are versed word by word of the Greek and the Hebrew, who when they translate it, they do not translate it to what they think it means, to what they believe already. It needs to be a pure translation and again like I say the closest we have to that probably uh, is the King James or like the Holman Christian Standard Bible well I hope you've learned something tonight